Welcome to a McKenzie Institute Long Talk. Well, I'm feeling either old or experienced today because I remember covering Fundy Tidal Power in the 70s. And that's right. a nuclear plant. Mike Dadswell has been studying this sort of stuff as well as a professor at Acadia University. And um, Professor Dadswell, if we can start with a great maritime expression, where are we at with Fundy Tidal Power now, uh, 50 years after I first heard about it? Well, um, I think they're sort of stalled at the moment, uh, partly because of technical problems and partly because of resistance. I don't know whether you've heard about the situation in Minas Passage, um, but that's uh, where they're trying to put these in-stream turbines in. And every time they do it, the turbine ends up breaking down or whatever. And uh, so I think that everybody's starting to lose patience and run out of money. The other operational plant, which was down to the Annapolis Royal, I don't know whether you know about that one at the, in the estuary. Well, that, that was finally closed down a year ago because they never had an operational permit. So somewhere along the line, they may get their permit back and they may start to operate again. But right now, there is no Fundy Tidal Power. Well, this had such great promise. We just thought many years ago uh, that the tide comes in, the tide goes out, you stick a turbine in there, and uh, the rest is history. But I was surprised to find my relatives are in Parsborough, Nova Scotia, where there's a demonstration project and a, a, some kind of a welcome center. And the turbines broke. I mean, this technology isn't exactly proven, is it? No, not at all. It seems to work off of Eastern or Western Europe. They've got some, some of those same turbines are in the water off Brittany where they have big tides as well. And some in, uh, in uh, the North Sea and the Celtic Sea in Britain. But um, Minus Passage has the biggest tides in the world and the most powerful currents. And I think there's just, and, and in a way, it's, it's sort of a depository region for everything that falls in the water and in, in the Bay of Fundy. So what's happening is there's great big huge trees wrapped in seaweed and everything coming up there and they're probably just going in the turbine and wrecking it, you know, so. Well, don't they have trees and seaweed in, in Europe? Not, not the same way, I don't think. I think I think the fact that uh, France and Britain and so forth have been developed for so long, they don't have the forest anymore that we do. And I think that's part of the problem. Then there's the huge lobster fishery and the lobster traps are always going into the turbines, the ones that get lost. And of course they wrap it up with rope and, tr and the traps and, and it, it just, it becomes a mess in no time. Now I, I'm a lay person. I said I covered this as a journalist, not as an academic. So. Can you compare run of the river power generation with a tidal power turbine that is stuck in a river? Are they much the same thing? They sound it. Oh yeah, many of them are identical. Um, in fact, the, the Annapolis uh, power plant over in, in Annapolis, Royal Nova Scotia, that, that's uh, the same turbine that they use in mountain rivers in Switzerland and Germany. So, um, you know, you, you can transfer it, but it's, it's just that the, the situation in Minas Basin is, is so different and so powerful that I don't think anybody's, I mean, they, they really need something, another turbine in front to chop up all the stuff that's, that's coming before it goes through the turbine, if you know what I mean. Well, I'm also thinking as a layperson that in Switzerland, to the best of my knowledge, the rivers run only downhill. Whereas with tidal power, you've got the whoosh of the tide coming in, but then it goes out as well. This must be tough on the impellers, propellers, or whatever gizmos are in that uh, generator. Yeah, that's part of the problem, the fact that it goes two ways. And it's just, you know, there's all kinds of stuff in there. And, and, and also, uh, I think just the, the actual um, strength of the flow is so high that they haven't designed something that can withstand it. All right, well, let's get on with the fish because, again, when I was working as a journalist in New Brunswick, uh, we didn't get to interview many fish or many fish advocates. Uh, the fish weren't really part of the equation. It was just 
let's get on with this tidal power. And we thought many of the natural resources, including fish, were limitless. I am really taken aback by your article, and I wish I could show an image of it, but you've taken pictures and published them of fish the size of a human being. I mean, I don't know how tall the person was that was laying beside a decapitated fish, but it looked like about a five foot fish, am I right? Oh yeah, and sturgeon get much bigger than that. I mean, they, the, the uh, maximum length from the St. John River is 14 feet or almost five meters, right? So um, that was sort of just a medium sized Atlantic sturgeon, not a big one, you know. And when you think of chopping up a mature fish like that in a, a power generating apparatus that doesn't really work all that well, gee, it's kind of macabre, isn't it? Yeah. It, well, the, the problem was is that um, I don't think people realize just how important the Bay of Fundy was to the fish resources of the East Coast of North America, and, and not just the local Canadian ones, the American ones as well. And um, the work that I was involved in since the 1970s pretty much showed that, that virtually every species, whether it's Atlantic salmon, uh, Atlantic shad, Atlantic sturgeon, any one of these species, they're migrating back and forth in vast numbers. And when you stick something, and, and I mean, they've evolved to that over the last 10 to 15,000 years. So you can't turn them off, right? They're not gonna change. So when you drop one of these turbines in front of them, bingo, you know, you're, you're processing millions of tons of fish. And, what about fish can... ladders and fishways and other fish things that are designed to help the fish get around these things? Well, they work in rivers, but they don't work very well in the ocean because of that, like you said, the two directions of the tide, flowing one way and then flowing the other way. Uh, Annapolis, in the Annapolis River where the turbine was, they did have a good fish pass situation with a, just a straight passageway, but the trouble is most of the water went through the turbine and of course the fish followed most of the water, so that was the problem. All right, so you've done your research, you've published your article, you've made your statement. Uh, Fundy Tidal Power is kind of on hold for other reasons, technological reasons. Any comment for people who are uh, thinking about researching and working on these kinds of uh, hydroelectric projects? Well, there's still lots to be done, that's for sure. Um, lots of other fish species, uh, lots of different types of designs of turbines. There is a Canadian turbine that they're putting in minus passage right now. I don't know how it's going to work out, but it doesn't seem to have as many problems because it's right up on the surface. So we'll see how that turns out. Well, interesting. I, I guess I'll have to pass the coverage of Fundy Tidal Power on to my kids or grandkids, uh, which I started in my teens, and you'll have to pass it on to your kids and grandkids uh, doing the research. Uh, uh, thank you for your perspective. It's great. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, people were talking about tidal power in the 1880s, so it's nothing new. Well, thanks very much for your perspective. Okay. Mike Dadswell has been thinking about and researching power generation for a long time as a professor at Acadia University. Um, welcome back, Mike. Fun to chat. Okay, hi there. Um, I, uh, in my research, have come up with some startling things, for me anyway, and that is dams have a limited life. Uh, they outlive their usefulness. Uh, some of them that ran grist mills uh, 150 years ago have been turned into power generation, but they're not without their complications. What is your view on small run of the river power generation dams? Well, they're a problem to migrating fish largely, um, unless the proper fish passage facilities are installed. And that means downstream as well as upstream. I mean, we have things like Atlantic salmon and shad and, and uh, Gaspero that migrate upstream to spawn. And then we have eels that migrate downstream so they can go to the Sargasso Sea and spawn. So in the upstream direction, you stop them. So you need to fish ladders to get them up above the dam. And in the downstream direction, 
they have to go through the turbines unless you have facilities to bypass the turbine and get the fish around them. So um, they're a problem in both directions. And unfortunately, back when they were building the first dams on rivers, the industrialization was more important to everybody than the fish were because there were so many rivers with fish in, everybody figured, well, heck, it doesn't matter if we get rid of one river. And uh, we soon found out that that was a bad way to think about it. And just because humans want the fish to do something and build a ladder or build an alternate route doesn't mean they'll take it, right? That's exactly true. And a lot of fish won't even use fish ladders. Uh, Atlantic sturgeon are one. They, they won't, you, you have to have a, an elevator for them to get them above a dam. So that's. Now, some people of goodwill who are watching this might say, well, look, uh, everything's a trade off. Um, we, harm some fish, but we get the hydroelectric power. What's your view of the trade-off? Well, the trade-off might have worked 100 years ago, but now that we've got lots of alternate sources of, of hydropower, of power, not hydropower, um, we don't need the hydroelectricity so much. And, and some countries, the United States for one is, a, or was, or is ahead of us in terms of removing dams from the river so that they can get the fish populations back. I mean, it was okay when you started out and you had one or two populations that were terminated, but after a while, um, runs of fish all up the east coast of the United States and into Canada were eliminated. And then you're eliminating a, a major source of renewable wealth, essentially. You, know. now you mentioned dam removal is a, a new thing in the United States, and uh, I agree with you. I've read about that. It, it's interesting to read the economic analysis that it is very often cheaper to remove a dam and restore the river than it is to repair the turbines, especially if they're old, uh, or to maintain fish ladders, which sometimes just get swept away in the storm. Uh, do you have a perspective on that? Yes. Uh, well, the thing is, is my perspective is that we can replace that power now. I mean, um, look at Germany. They, they've managed to replace a huge amount of their power between solar and, and the wind and, and the solar power. Um, they're further north than we are, and they're doing great with solar power. So there's no reason why we can't. Um, I mean, all you have to do is, is set up your system so that it works on the different types of power production and storage. So it's, it's not really a problem. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned solar because wind, of course, does kill birds and bugs and that uh, coating on the, uh, on the propellers, if that's what they're called, uh, reduces the generation. And then it, someone's predicting that by 2050, there will be tens of millions of tons of unrecyclable blades from turbines. Uh, <laughs> have you encountered that uh, data? No, no, I, I didn't know that the blades were a problem, but uh, I don't see why they're unrecyclable or, you know, they're, what are they made of? Well, neither do I, but I guess it involves having to take them apart or something like that, or maybe that's just uh, a propaganda from people who don't like uh, wind turbines. Uh, yeah, that could be. Now, let's take it to one of my favorite spots. Uh, I went to UNB and spent a lot of time in St. Andrews and St. Stephen and uh, the St. Croix River, uh, or Skutik, as it's called by the indigenous people, um, has uh, probably North America's oldest run of the river uh, plant on it. Have you looked into it? I, I haven't really studied it, but I certainly know the history of the fish around it. I mean, the St. Croix used to have one of the biggest populations of Gaspero or alewife, whatever you want to call them, river herring, uh, in, in, on the east coast of North America. Huge population. And that was largely because of all the lakes that were on the St. Croix River system. Um, once they were denied access to those lakes, pretty much, because they don't like to use fishways either, um, that was it to that big population. And there's a, there's, you know, there's a substantial amount of money is removed from the economy when you do that, right? You, okay, you gain some power, but you lose the other renewable resource. I mean, it's like tidal power. It, you know, you might gain a little electricity from the tidal power, but you lose a huge amount of renewable resource in terms of the fishery. 
Now that's hard to quantify. You mentioned uh, some value is taken out of the economy. I suppose countless people uh, fish and have a meal or two over the summer or maybe a dozen. And there is some tourism uh, generated by fishing and by whale watching and what have you. But that's really hard to quantify compared to X number of kilowatts uh, heating Y or powering Y number of homes. That's a tough calculation, isn't it? It is, but um, people do, you know, work it out. I mean, there's a fish called striped bass that lives on the East Coast of North America and, you know, has an incredible recreational fishery as well as a commercial one. And the recreational fishery is actually worth about four times the commercial fishery um, in terms of bait, lures, people staying in motels where the best fishing is, buying their meals, you know, fishing licenses, it goes on and on and on. And it ends up being a heck of a lot of money. Now, would you say that calculation again? You're saying the fishing industry is worth four times what? The recreational fishing, in other words, the guys with the rods and the girls with the rods that go to fish for striped bass, are worth more than the commercial fishery, the guys with the nets that go out to catch them to sell in, in fish stores. So for people of our age who remember um, uh, Opie and Sheriff Taylor walking to the uh, fishing pond with their rods over their backs at the beginning of uh, the Andy Griffith show, that's the kind of thing that is more valuable than a commercial fishing boat? It, it is, um, you know. I mean, take something like Atlantic salmon. Uh, Atlantic salmon in a lot of the part of the East Coast of North America is, is considered to be in danger. But where you have good Atlantic salmon fishing rivers, there's a huge industry in terms of recreational fishing for Atlantic salmon. So basically what's happened is the Department of Fish in Canada has closed all the commercial fishery in Canada so that it's only a recreational fish. And, and they've done that because they know that it generates far more dollars into the economy than the commercial fishery ever did. Uh, Mike, that's well interesting stuff. Anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Uh, I used to live in St. Andrews too, and I used to go to uh, fish for smelt below the, the dam on the St. Croix, and I always thought it'd be wonderful if they finally removed it, so I'm glad to hear they're going to. Uh, apparently that's the case. Now, um, as an old broadcaster, I'm an incorrigible pun maker. If I had uh, an art department and could hang a sign, gone fishing, to end this interview, or if I could wish you happy fishing, I would but that's probably overdoing it. I'll just say thanks very much. Okay, thank you, and I'll go fishing. <laughs> Any views expressed here are not necessarily those of the McKenzie Institute, its speakers, sponsors, or supporters. But the Institute is dedicated to fostering public discussion, debate, and education about security matters. Google the McKenzie Institute to join the discussion. The McKenzie Institute is grateful to its sponsors and supporters, some of our short pods and long talks are a result of the support of Heathbridge Capital Management Limited, The National Post, and Dundurn Publishing.